There was a gentleman who used to sit sort of on that side of the church building in those pews there, a young guy named Jesse. Uh, several of you got to visit with him. I mentioned him a week or so ago. Jesse's not doing well. Um, he wishes he could be with us. He's not in Esteban working at this time, but he writes me all the time. And uh, I know he watches the videos all the time, and he, he's thankful for our prayers. And I just want to tell you, Jesse, that we're thinking about you, and, uh, and we will continue to pray for your health and your well-being. Uh, Bob and Avidel too. Uh, we love you guys lots. I know you watch this too. So uh, know that you're missed in this place, but know that you've blessed lots of people too. So thank you for, for that. <coughs> Philippians chapter 4. When the Berlin Wall was built in the early 60s, it caused trouble for lots and lots of people. It divided families, it divided a nation, it divided a city, and it caused lots and lots of heartache and lots of problems. But one of the places that it affected was this little church building uh, in the middle of Berlin. Uh, the church building is, the church was called the Church of the Resurrection. And uh, the problem with the wall was that, as you can see in this photo, the eastern side of the wall went along the back of the church building, and the western side of the wall went along the front of the church building, leaving the church building in no man's land. And so for years and years, for over 20 years, it just sat there being unused, and, and no one could go and visit it, no one could do anything in there, people lost their place of worship, and, and there was just no connection with it anymore. People lobbied the East German government trying to figure out what to do about it. How can we get access to it? Because there's, there's no way we can cross into this zone to get to this building. And so the East German government came up with an idea. They decided, here's how we're going to solve this problem. Here's how we're going to fix your problem about your church. They blew it up. They destroyed it in 1985. They decided, we're sick of hearing you complain about not being able to go to your church building, so we're going to blow it up and just get rid of it. I think that story is ironic for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's called the Church of Reconciliation, and they blew it up, so I don't know that they understood what the word reconciliation means exactly. Um, but the other reason I tell you this story is because I think this is how lots of people deal with conflict. I think it's a good example of how people deal with their interpersonal problems. They either for 20 years pretend nothing's going on, nothing's happening, there is no problem at all, or it's a major blow up. Right? That's how most of us handle things. We either avoid it completely and just pretend to be peaceful, or we have a full out war. I've seen that lots of times, and in fact, I've done that lots of times. Uh, and I want to suggest to you that there's a better approach, a better way to do things, a better way to handle our problems than just to face each other down, okay, corral style, and just see who's standing last after the bullets stop flying, right? It's got to be a better way to do things, especially for Christian folks. And so the Apostle Paul is going to, in this little passage of Scripture, and it is a very short passage, but he's going to do two things that are, that are shocking in a way, because they're not what I would have expected him to do with a conflict that's going on in the church. One of the things that Paul does, as I said earlier, is something that you understand should be done, but most of us don't do. And the other thing Paul does is something that I'm not even sure we understand we should be doing, but we should be. And that's going to form the, for, the basis of our sermon this morning. Those two things. Something you already know that you're not doing and something you should be doing that you may not know you're supposed to be doing, but need to start doing. Now, before we start, let, let me just be very clear about our goal here. Sometimes when people start talking about conflict and not getting along, they get the wrong goal in mind. And the goal is not to eliminate all conflict. The goal is not to eliminate all conflict because that's impossible. Anytime you get two people together, you're going to have conflict. Anytime you get two people together, more than two people together, you're going to have differing ideas. Uh, I, I read a thing one time that said inconvenience is the measurement of relationship, right? If you don't have any inconvenience, you're not really in relationship with someone. They're just an acquaintance. Uh, real relationships inconvenience us. They, we rub against each other wrong sometimes. And, and that's just inevitable in some ways. Uh, most of those things are very small and don't really matter, but, but they're there. So the goal isn't to eliminate all conflict. 
The goal is actually just to handle it better, or at least give ourselves some tools that will allow us to do that. Again, you know, this passage of scripture doesn't give us every tool we need. It's not going to help in every circumstance. But if we could just understand these two things that happen here, I think it would sort out a lot of different issues that happen in churches all the time. So let's jump in and see what Paul does. We'll read the scripture first, and then we'll see what Paul does to try and mediate the problem. Philippians chapter 2, or chapter 4, verse 2 says this. I plead with Eodia and with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Eodia and Syntyche are two women in the church in Philippi who are obviously having a dispute about something. It's a dispute that has become large enough that the Apostle Paul hears about it even though he's in prison, possibly in Rome, quite a ways away. The, the story of their dispute has got out of the church building, and so it's something that is boiling over, and he decides to say to them that I'm going to plead with you to agree with one another in the Lord. Verse 3, yes, and I ask you, dear loyal yoke fellow, to help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, who name, whose names are written in the book of life. Now those two verses are very short, and they may not tell us a lot. They may not tell us everything we need, but I do think they tell us two very interesting things, because Paul does two very decisive moves in these two little verses. Number one, I want you to notice that he calls out the problem. I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to imagine that for a second. Just imagine your first century church and, and you've received a letter from the Apostle Paul, and for three chapters he's been talking about beautiful things. He's been talking about grace and kindness, and how God has forgiven us, and he's gone on all these beautiful passages, and you're just sitting in your church pew listening to it, and you're so happy because it sounds so nice and it's so good, and then he, the reading continues and he says, oh by the way, you and you get it together. How would you feel if you were those two women? How would you feel if you were those two women that just got called out in front of everyone? Got called out in front of the whole congregation? Got called out in front of everybody who's ever going to read this letter that you two were causing trouble and you better get it sorted out? I think it's interesting that Paul calls them out in a public letter and says, you, Yodi and Syntyche, get, stop this. You've got, to, you've got to agree in the Lord. Depending on what version you're reading there, it says in the NIV, I plead with Euodia and Syntyche. Other versions say, I urge you, I beg you, I plead with you to sort out your issues. There is no time for Paul to wait here. This must be resolved quickly. He, he doesn't have time to wait until he gets out of jail and can come and see them and sit down and talk to them. That, that's going to be too late. He doesn't want to wait that long. You've got to solve it now. There's not time for them just to let it maybe blow over because it's been going on long enough and we've got to do something about it now. I plead with you. I urge you. You've got to do something right now about it. Why? Because when we leave things unattended, problems typically escalate. Now, let me say there is sometimes a, a cooling off period that's wise. You might want to let everybody calm down a half a second before you try and sort things out. That's okay. But the longer we allow something to continue, the worse it's going to become. Lots of people have tried to chart things like this, and I've had this chart sitting in my sermon illustration folder for a long time. came from a book I read about 10 years ago. This guy said there were five levels of conflict, and he tries to describe it this way. Again, you might describe it in other ways, but number one is a problem to solve. And again, as I said at the start of the sermon, there's always going to be problems to solve. Some of them are big, some of them are small, but you're always going to have things to sort your way through. And so that's not a bad thing. There's just an issue we need to deal with. Secondly, there comes maybe to some disagreement, right? You see it one way, I see it another way. That's okay. What happens next, though? 
He says, if we don't solve it very quickly, it starts to devolve into a contest or into a struggle. It doesn't become any more just about the issue that we're dealing with. Now it becomes about who's going to win. Am I going to get my way or is Diane getting her way? And and the focus switches from the conflict itself to to who's on my side and who's going to win and how are we going to sort this out? And, And it becomes a struggle, right? From there, the struggle becomes... Uh, comes down to either one of two options. We're going to have an all-out fight because we haven't sorted it out yet and I've got to decide whether I'm going to win or she's going to win. It actually becomes a fight. And I've seen that happen in churches, by the way. I haven't seen it here. But I have heard of places in churches, believe it or not, churches who've had fist fights at men's meetings. Like two guys getting a fist fight at a church meeting. I've seen I've seen people insulting one another, like saying rude words to people, like things I've never would never say to somebody at hockey gets said at church meetings sometimes. I've heard people be insulting and rude. I've heard people gossiping about one another, trying to get people on their side of the issue. Did you know what about we're talking about everybody else instead of talking to them? And we get in this, this fight mode, or we get in a flight mode. This happens a lot too. Uh, it used to happen a lot, not so much anymore. I'll give us credit for growing up, but it used to be, you think the way I think or get out. That used to be how we handled division in the church. You think like me or get out of here. And then we'd all sit around after we drove everybody out who didn't think like me, and then we'd sit around and pat ourselves on the back. Well, look how unified we are. We're so, we've got so much peace around here. Well, of course you do. You drove out everybody who didn't think like you. The last thing he says, if you don't, if you get to the place of fighting or running away, uh, if you, then the last part of that is that you've got a virtually impossible situation. Intractable is the word the guy used. I didn't know what intractable means, so I had to look it up. But it's virtually impossible to solve. There's so much water under the bridge, so many mean things said, so many dumb things happened. You're just, you can't put it back together even if you wanted to. That, that's his chart of how most conflicts work their way out and, uh, and work their way to the extreme. And, and here's why I give you this chart, because I want you to see what Paul has done. Paul has said, deal with it quickly. Yodia and Syntyche, get it together. You can't keep doing this. Here's why. Because if you let it get to the third step, after the first two steps, you're in huge trouble. After the first two steps, you're in a win or lose situation. After the first two steps, you're already starting to hurt one another. He says, I don't want you doing that. That is not your position. That's not who we are. (coughs) Solve it quickly. Get it over with and figure out an answer before it becomes a fight, before it becomes personal, before it becomes mean, before it becomes something that starts dragging other people in. Get it figured out. And I, and I think I, I, I'm shocked by the fact that he would call them out, but it makes sense, because he wants them to get it solved now. Because if you let it keep going, it's going to be harder to stop. It's going to cause more problems. We saw a good example of that this past week with the train derailment out in McCoon. When is the best time to stop a trailing train derailment? Before it happens, right? As soon as the first car comes off the track, you're in trouble. As soon as the first car comes off the track, you're going to start taking other cars off the track. You're going to start having a fire that's going to go for three or four days. You're going to end up blocking Highway 39. You're going to affect a lot of people. As soon as the first car comes off the track, you're in trouble. So don't let that happen. Get on it quickly. Figure it out. You cannot just let it Go on and on and on and on. So he pleads with them. Agree with one another in the Lord. Let's get going. I like the fact that Jesus said that too. In in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Settle matters quickly with your adversary. Do not let them build up. Do not let them drag other people in. It is not wise and it will not help. 
A gentleman said to me one time that problems do not destroy you, unresolved problems do, right? Problems don't destroy a group, unresolved problems do. And so he says, I don't want you just to let it keep going. I don't want you just to keep it simmering. That is unwise. Wayne Dyer, who's a business guy, once said, conflict cannot survive without your participation. Right? You can't, you can't fight with me if I just refuse not to fight. I'm not going to fight with you. Let's sort it out, right? My kids are sitting here. Can I give my kids a pat on the back? I love that about my kids. When we've had a discussion, or a, they've learned that well so from somewhere, and it's not from me. It's my kids who will come and say, can we talk about this? That's beautiful. Because I'm more the one to hold a grudge and cross my arms and say, well, you stupid jerks. You can... <laughs> They're the ones who come and say, we need to sort this out. I've seen them do it lots. Probably learned it from their mother. <laughs> he calls them out. You can't do that. That's the part you probably already know. You probably already knew that. The problem is we just don't do it very often, right? I like to hold my grudges. I like to remember what you did. I like to sort of stir the pot once in a while. I like to be right. I want to win the fight. I don't want to just give up. Solve your problems quickly. That's the first thing that happens here. I want you to notice the second thing that happens here. And this is the part we may not understand that we are part of. This may be the part that you didn't even know you were supposed to be doing. So here's where we get some new knowledge. I want to suggest to you the second part that Paul does that is surprising is that he calls in the church. First he called out the problem, but notice that he calls in the church. These two women are fighting. He says, I want you to solve it. But then look at verse 3. He says, I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, loyal worker, my friend. We don't know who that person is, but he's, he's addressing someone else in the congregation. And he's saying, these two women are fighting. I want you to help them sort it out. <laughs> Doesn't that sound strange? Like lots of times in the church, we kind of say, oh no, 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 I'm not getting involved. That's between Tom and Jeff. I'm not getting involved in their fight. Yes, you are. Yes, you're supposed to. Loyal yoke fellow, help these women get along. He calls in the church. Not only does he call in the church, he says, I want you to help these women who've contended at my side for the cause of the gospel. He reminds them of who they are. You're not two women who fight with each other. You are members of the church. You are people who've contended for the gospel. You've done good work before. He talks about a guy named Clement. We have no idea who Clement is, but he says, you worked along with Clement. Clement's a good guy, and he loves both of you. You need to get it together, because you guys are all part of the body. You guys need to help each other out. Oh, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. Paul says, you guys need to sort out your issues, but here's what's going to happen. The church is going to help you do it. Now that's a beautiful thing, because as I said before, lots of times when disputes happen in the church, the church doesn't help put it out. The church fuels the problem. The church starts picking sides. Church starts saying, well, I'm with Daryl. I don't care who's against Daryl. I'm going to stand with Daryl. And if they want to stand with Grace, then well, they can go do that. I'm going to stand with Daryl. Right? That's how we act. That's what happens. That's how churches split. And, and so he calls them in and he says, you are to be the helpers. You are supposed to help these women get together. The church is supposed to be a place where grace is on display. The church is supposed to be a showroom for what God's people act like even when there's problems. The church is supposed to be a place that is active, not passive. We are supposed to be helping and doing things to make things better. We are supposed to be building bridges and encouraging. Our culture is supposed to be one of celebrating each other, not criticizing and nitpicking and complaining. There is nothing more discouraging to me. There is nothing more shameful in my mind, then when Christians can't find a way to get along. I think that is absolutely shameful. 
We sometimes think that the sins we involve ourselves in are the most shameful thing that could ever happen to us, that I've made a huge mistake and everybody knows that I'm actually a sinner that I've always been. But I would tell you that two brothers or two sisters who cannot figure out how to love each other is way more shameful than someone who's made a mistake. Because you are choosing to not like one another. You are choosing to say, Daryl doesn't have to like Grace, and Grace doesn't have to like Daryl. That's a choice. That's not a mistake. And that is wrong. Paul calls in the church because the church is supposed to be different. The church is supposed to be a place that heals things. The church is supposed to be a place that helps them come together. The church is supposed to be something else. My illustration of this here was going to be this, that we are supposed to be like this. I don't know if you've seen this before, but this is a firewall from the town of Ogama. In 1915, a guy tipped over a gasoline lamp and it burned down his building on Main Street and it burned down the entire side of Main Street one time. And so after that great big fire happened, the city or the town of Ogama decided they were going to build a firewall on the west side of the street. And they built this wall. This wall was eight, 28 feet high, 16 inches thick, 70 feet long, and it extended eight feet underground. And the idea was that if a fire started, it would hit that firewall and it would be stopped and we'd save the rest of the town. On the other side of the street, they built a fire hall made out of brick, and that was the firewall on that side. And, and so the firewall was built because they were trying to stop the fire that's already begun. And my illustration to you was going to be that that's who we are. We are the people who put the fires out. And I thought that was a pretty good illustration until two things. Number one, I realized the firewall blew over two years ago. It doesn't exist anymore. By the way, they didn't maintain it. That was the problem. They didn't maintain it. Now it doesn't exist. Something illustri illustrative there. But I got thinking, not only are we not supposed, not only are we the ones who are supposed to put the fires out, that's not even good enough. That's not even who we are. We, we're supposed to even be better than that. So I came up with a different illustration. You and I and the church is, are supposed to be this. Can you see the, what this is? You might call it a moret or something. It is a wire connector. This is our job. You are supposed to be a person who is connecting things. You are supposed to be a person individually. Your job. Do you know this? Do you know this? Your job is to make connections. Your job is to make connections. In this group, in this town, between one another, between people and God. Your job is to make connections. And so when Paul looks and he sees Euodia is here and Syntyche is here, he says, oh no, 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 that's not how it works. That's not going to be good enough. You know what we need? We need the church to come together, and you guys are going to tie these women together. Because this is what the church is supposed to do. The church is a connector. You, your job is to be a connector. And if we are not doing this job, we are not being the church. That we are supposed to be. We are not being God's people in the way we're supposed to be. We are to be connecting one another. And this is why it's shameful when fistfights start in churches. This is why it's shameful when gossip goes through us like a wildfire. This is why it's shameful when you don't know where somebody else works and they've been worshiping you with you for 10 years. This is why you need to know Parker won an award. This is why you need to know these things, because we are in the connection business. And this is why Clement is told, come and help these women get together, because you are a connector.
Larry sitting up front. Can I tell you that's something Larry does really well? Larry goes to coffee shops. I've met more people because of Larry. More people have come to this church because of Larry, because he just says, why don't you come to church with me? Larry's a connector. Beautiful. Larry doesn't get up and preach. Larry feels bad about that sometimes. Don't feel bad about it, Larry. What you do is better than what I do. You're a connector. You're supposed to be doing that. Paul calls in the church because they are the connectors. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2, if you want to flip over to 1 Peter chapter 2 for a second, I want to read you a passage there. In, in 1 Peter 2, uh, he's writing about uh, the change that comes uh, when we become Christian people. And so 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 says this, Therefore, because you are Christian people right now, here's what he tells them. Therefore, rid yourselves, get rid of this stuff, get rid of malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander of every kind. We like the next verse. We read the next verse a lot. The next verse says, like newborn babes crave spiritual milk, pure spiritual milk. So you'll grow up in this, your salvation now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. We like that verse because it talks about growing up in God and being mature and whatever. Notice in this passage that mature Christians who are growing up in their salvation not only love God, but they treat each other properly. No malice, no deceit. No envy, no hypocrisy, no gossiping. You don't tear each other apart, you put each other together. Or as one author said about this, he said, Our new birth is not intended just to right the wrongs in our relationship with God. Our hearts are made new by the love of God so that others benefit from the deep, heartfelt affection we have for them. Your salvation changes your relationship with God, but it ought to change the way you see each other in the church. It ought to change the way you see people around town, the people you work with, the people you hang out with. It ought to change because you are a connector. You're supposed to be helping each other come together. You're helping other people come to God. That is our job. And that's why Paul calls in the church to help out in this place. As I said before, the church is a place where grace is on display. It should be the showroom of God's grace. This is what it looks like when God's grace is in the mix. This is how we act. This is how we treat each other. This is how we solve our differences. This is how we get along. And it's graceful because that's who we are. Life in the body is so much bigger and important than the petty little squabbles that often derail us. Life in the body and our actual job here is so much bigger than the things that sometimes derail us. I was reading last week in the news, there's a new trend going on right now. Has anyone ever heard of this? It's called sleep tourism. Anyone ever heard of sleep tourism? Go Google it sometime. Sleep tourism. There are, there are hotels that are actually setting up rooms that have special silencing stuff in them and special drinks in them and special beds in them and special pillows and people are actually renting these rooms and going on vacation so they can get some sleep. People are so stressed out and so tired. They're going on vacation not to experience something. They're going on vacation just to get some sleep, just to get some rest somewhere. We live in a world that is just stressed out and worn out and tired out. We are living in a world that is just dying for some peacefulness. Just a moment, just a time where I could take my breath and go, If we understand who we're supposed to be, and if we acted the way we were supposed to act, people wouldn't need a place like that to get away, they could come here. Because we're the peace of the place. In, in he oh, let me skip that one. In, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, it says, 
See that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See what he's saying? Trouble will come. Bitterness will come. Problems will be around if you miss out on God's graciousness. If you do not live a graceful life. If you do not give grace to each other, you're going to have trouble. Turn it around, though. If you do find the grace of God, if you do make that the center of your relationships, more than that, if you remember God has treated you graciously, he's overlooked a lot of things that he could have slapped you for, then you're likely going to treat others graciously too. Remember how you've been treated so you remember how to treat one another. This passage, this little screed thing here said, Call me crazy, but I love to see other people happy and succeeding. Life's a journey, not a competition. Can we cheer for each other? Can we celebrate one another? Can we look for the good in each other? Can we be happy for one another? Can we be interested in one another? Can we connect to one another? Can we be a showroom of God's graciousness? Dear sisters, stop squabbling. There's bigger things going on. Church, help them get together because we've got to understand who we are. We are a group of people who are saved by grace. And we need to show that so others see what God's grace looks like. Every Sunday, we are reminded that grace is the big part of who we are. Every Sunday, we end our service by remembering the grace that has been shown to us in the cross. Can we then be people of that cross and that grace and show that in every other relationship? Connect people to each other. Connect people to God. That is our job. Good morning. Let's take some time together this morning to remember the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. As we remember, I'd like to be reminded by a little piece of scripture. It says, it is, it is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ, and is not the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ, because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body, but we all share in one loaf. Let's go in prayer. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the blessings that you've given us. We are thankful, Father, for Christ and the sacrifice that he's made. And we pray, Father, that you would guide us as we remember that sacrifice today. Be with each of us as we pray. And we offer in this prayer in Christ's name. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks at this time for this food and wine, for the reminder of the blood of Christ that was shed on that cruel cross for us. Guide us, Father, as we partake, for we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Again, to those who are watching on video, we want to thank you for doing that. I'd encourage you to subscribe to our Facebook page, that way you won't miss any 
sermon videos or anything else that we post. Thank you for joining with us. We'll see you next time.